I, Mike Harlan came to my rescue and uh, offered me a spot on the Superman book. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, so Thunderstrike was, it was more than what a lot of us were expecting. I, to this day, I'm surprised and gratified and, and everything when, when people come up to me and ask for sketches of Thunderstrike at conventions or bring their runs of Thunderstrike to have signed, they're doing Thunderstrike action figures now. Yeah, absolutely. Like 20 absolutely. some years after, it's like, we really could have used that at the time too. <laughs> <laughs> I, why now? I don't get it. I don't get it. But, but it's a great thought, and, and, and Kevin, go ahead and ask your question, but it is a great thing that you, you managed to accomplish. Creating a new established character is, is a rare gem that not everybody could claim credit to. Well, yeah. and that's true. And then, I mean, but I think, you know, War Machine is still something that came up in the movies, you know, sure. with uh, Jim Rhodes using War Machine. And, and people talk about, you know, would you like to see uh, Thunderstrike in a movie? Yeah, I'd like to see Thunderstrike in a movie, but I, I don't know how they would do it with the version of Thor that they have now sure, sure. or why they would do it, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I'm still amazed. And again, you know, this is about levels and this is about accepting not getting what you really want. Uh, Tom and I got, cre I got a, a couple of movie credits uh, because, and the reason we got them, some people think we got a credit in Endgame because of Cap lifting the hammer, but I don't believe that's the case. I, the reason we got a credit in Endgame is the same reason we got a credit in the two Ant-Man movies is when they decided they were gonna do the two generations with, with Henry Pym and Scott Lang and have Hank's daughter, somebody went on Google and said, does Hank Pym have a daughter anywhere in the Marvel Universe? And in uh -huh. MCU, we had his daughter who was Red Queen, uh, but we, we named her Hope, Hope Pym, and, uh, and they used that. So that's why we get the credit, I'm sure, because Hope shows up in Endgame. So, that's our one claim to fame in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That, <laughs> it's there. It's and there. We, also, we actually got a credit on the, the S.H.I.E.L.D. TV show at one point. We got a thank you on the S.H.I.E.L.D. TV show. And that was even more ridiculous because that was before, because they were using agents from the actual different runs of S.H.I.E.L.D. comic books. And we did a Thor miniseries where uh, Thor, I'm sorry, it was Hercules, the Hercules miniseries, three issue Hercules miniseries, where he worked with S.H.I.E.L.D. and we introduced an agent named Agent, I think it was 30, 34 or 33 or something. I remember like that. <laughs> but uh, her name was uh, Cara, Cara Lynn Palamas, which was a name we stole from Star Trek, who was on the, uh, the Apollo episode of Star Trek. So it was all Star Trek geekery, but they used, that agent number, and they they called her Kara once or twice. I mean, she she was a brunette instead of a blonde. She had she was not a, 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 a myth a mythology expert or anything like a history expert or anything. Nothing like the character we did, but because they used thirty three and Kara, we got a little thank you. So. Interesting. So they're trying. They're really trying, but they're sometimes it's just silliness. You know, I mean, it's one of those things. Mr. Friends, I have two separate questions for you. With the success of Supergirl for TV, the material that's been done for the Arrowverse, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, I love it, yeah. If, if you had to pick another DC character that would be done for TV, where would you go? Who would you pick? And the other question I have for you, is kind of a generational thing with um, with everything changing within the industry itself right. and it appears that a lot of comics have gotten darker in tone how do you feel about those changes well Great uh, question. second question first i i don't like the dark stuff at all i i think it's ridiculous when i was in my 20s i was kind of fascinated by it but long term i don't think it serves anybody well uh you know, comics, I mean, I, I don't see a problem with having a separate line that's for that kind of thing. But I think taking the comics further and further away from the newsstand and uh, a, as entertainment for kids of all ages is a mistake, uh, frankly. Uh, Thank you so much for saying that. 
It's become sort of a niche thing that I, I don't agree with that at all. So if you wanted to do a max line or, you know, some kind of a line that, you know, was in plastic that's up on the thing and you desperately need to see Reed and Sue have sex, then, you know, that's for you guys, you know, that kind of thing. I don't think the, yeah. main, the mainstream books should, should be worried about that kind of stuff at all. I think they should be mass market entertainment. That's one of the reasons why I enjoy the movies more than I enjoy a lot of the books because the movies are made for mass market entertainment. They're, they're there to entertain kids from six to 60. And for the most part, they're succeeding incredibly well. So they're doing what the comics should be doing. And exactly. Uh, that's just my personal feeling on the matter. The, uh, as far as picking a DC character, I, the, the only name that occurred to me while you were asking the question, Kevin, was uh, Nightwing. I, I'm, a big ah. Dick Grayson, I'm a big Dick Grayson fan. I mean, I know Thank they're you, playing on the Titans TV series, <laughs> and I don't, I don't have any streaming serv services. I, don't, I haven't seen any of that stuff. I haven't even seen the Netflix shows. So I haven't seen Titans, but the actor that they hired seems to be pretty cool for it and everything. I, but I liked the uh, Chuck Dixon, Scott McDaniel run on, on Nightwing very much. It was my favorite book at the time, and I got a big kick out of it. And I, I, I liked the character of Dick Grayson. I liked the, you know, the, the, the history of the character having been Batman's uh, partner and everything. So I would keep all of that. You know, I, I, you know I, again, though, I wasn't really impressed when I saw the trailers and the F Batman stuff and everything to kind of, you know, set the tone for what this show was going to be. I don't know. The show seems, the tone seems to have lightened up quite a bit because they have quite a few costumes and they're getting the characters kind of right from what I'm seeing, like in season two and all this kind of stuff. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, if you're talking about like a, a solo series of a character I'd really enjoy seeing, uh, Nightwing would be one, Hawkman would be one. I love Hawkman. Did you ever see the pilot they did? Um, for Aquaman, the small bill uh, guy. Yes, yes, I did. It's out, it's out there. You can find it at conventions, bootleg and stuff. Yes, I well, did. I really enjoyed that pilot. I thought that was terrific. That I, that's, I would have watched the heck out of that show. That that's one of my personal. Oh, you are you kidding? You got rid of this? Yeah. You decided not to do this? Yeah. At some point, yeah, the WB decided that was that was. Uh, a bridge too far and they ended up it, it was the guy that played green arrow on uh, uh justin hartley and actually now, he's one yeah, of the cast members on this is us on this is us exactly exactly and uh because i i have a dear friend who's a big fan of this is us and i'm going hey, it's aquaman cool yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah i i, I love that pilot so, you know, I, I'm a big Aquaman fan from back in the Nick Cardi days and stuff. But I, I listened to you carefully, and I think you reveal yourself a little bit. So I'm going to ask you a, a Now, wait a minute. Now, don't, don't say that on Zoom. That means something completely different on Zoom now. I did not, That's right. I did not reveal myself on Zoom. <laughs> uh, you're right. Front, so behave you yourself. <laughs> let me ask you this question. As accepting as you are of the movies, of the changes, and by the way, just so you know, for the record, I've had to tone down my purist sensibilities <laughs> tremendously to accept sure. and enjoy the movies. Just to but survive. I enjoy just the movies that are good, uh, and, and I don't enjoy the movies that are bad. So here's a question I have for you. You've said this many, many times throughout this interview. You've said, now oh, they haven't done the movie that I would have made, or I would have done it differently. So here's my question to you. Uh, if you had the opportunity with a $200 million budget and the gift of being a genius director, how would you have handled Thor? What would you have done? What would I have done? I, I, I would have gone to the source material. I mean, I, I don't think I would have gone too far from the source material. Which, is there any particular story? Is there any particular thing that you would have wanted that you, you needed to have depicted in that movie? Hmm. I, I, I tell you, somewhere in the first trilogy, I would have done the story where he meets Hercules and then goes to hell to defend Hercules, even Ooh, though he doesn't story. like the guy. Great that, story. Ori that original Lee Kirby, you know, Hercules is a lot of fun, but that said so much about Thor. 
because he didn't even like the guy. Nice to hurt you, right? And he and he went and he went to hell for him. And so I think that would be in there somewhere. You know, I was always kind of hoping that um, The Rock did his, uh, Dwayne Johnson did his Hercules movie. I just saw it on TV a little while ago. I never saw it in the theaters. And I was hoping that was going to be like this huge hit. And then Marvel would get the idea to offer Dwayne Johnson the role of Hercules in the Marvel movie. <laughs> Chris Hemsworth. Because I think he could play the hell out of Marvel's Hercules. Yeah, he could. And, you know, and that would force Chris Hemsworth to be the straight man a little bit. Yes. And and then they could do, like, you know, that whole Pluto story and everything and how cool that would be. And everything. so, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, yeah. I mean, but I, I most of my issues with, when I say, you know, they haven't made the movie I would make, uh, I think they go big too fast in in the movies now it, because you, you they, it's always gotta be the entire city's in danger or, you know, there's, there's big splashy bad guys and stuff. And especially like with Spider-Man, that's not what Spider-Man is, you know? I think Spider-Man would have worked better, especially these days as a, as a TV series where you, you can get to develop the characters and the supporting cast and all this kind of stuff, and you're still able to do the special effects you need to do, but that you can, you know, I mean, these are serialized stories. And I think to a large extent, a lot of those stories would, would translate better as television than as, than as big budget movies, because big budget movies are two hours at a time and out, you know. Um, so, I, you know, that was my dream of always, I always wanted to see a Spider-Man series that, you know, once they did like Hill Street Blues that would do Ooh. continuing storylines that wasn't just episodic, yeah. you always had a beginning, a middle, and an end, but you also had plot threads that ran through. That's, that's exactly what Stan was doing on Spider-Man. So once that, once shows like Hill Street Blues broke that wall, and LA law and things like that. And they started to do yeah. that kind of thing. I was like, now somebody needs to do a Spider-Man series. Now somebody needs, because for me, did you ever see the Japanese Spider-Man series? Did you ever yes. see it? I've, yeah, I haven't watched the show, but I've seen it, you know, I've seen clips of it. it they did such a light, uh, such a really great job of, of suggesting wall crawling in, in, in all kinds of clever little ways. And, and him swinging around the city in, in, in clever different ways that they didn't do in the American version. So there's all kinds of things. And I used to always just stand a picture, you know, I, I'd like to see Spider-Man in a cloth costume that looks like Peter Parker could have made himself because it's there, you know, it can be done. It doesn't always have to be, you know, I mean, you can have him upgrade it, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, my idea for in a movie would be, the costume that he makes to audition for America's Got Talent <laughs> would would look like he made it himself, because that would look like the costume that was on the Electric Company. Okay? <laughs> and then once he gets paid, because you know sooner or later he did get paid something for some of those appearances. Once he gets paid, he could upgrade it to something that looks more like you know what we've. What we what we've seen in the films, and then move on from there, you know. But I want Pete, you know, I, I like that's what I like in the in the Tom Holland movies is that he's he's in he's on Long Island, he's there with the elevated train and he's in the neighbor they're shooting in the neighborhood that he would really be in, and things like that. And I like you know they still talk about why can't you just be a friendly neighborhood Spider Man? And that's you know I would play that up. I'm surprised. I'm surprised based on what you're saying that you you don't quote you don't re reference Toby Maguire's Spider-Man because to me Spider-Man 2 comes as close to capturing the characters as any to me Spider-Man 2 and Iron Man John Favreau's Iron Man uh, came as close to capturing the characters as any movie has ever done. I don't disagree. I, I thought the first Raimi Spider-Man nailed it. Like I said, I mean he he captured the core of the character by having the origin play out the way it did by by having everybody on Pete's side when he lets the criminal go, that's the that becomes the core of the character. <coughs> so, I mean, it's it, you know, 
I did a couple of Facebook posts where I talked about, you know, evergreen casting, you know, like when I was, when I was a kid and when I was on the book, the, the actors that I sometimes pictured playing different roles and, you know, play, playing Jameson and playing Pete and playing Mary Jane and all this kind of stuff. And if you, if you go to my Facebook page, you can scroll back, you can find them. But, you know, I, I have all the same opinions that, you know, any fan does. And that's the point. My, my opinions are no more legitimate than, than any fans, you know, Understood. I, I'm not arrogant enough to think that because I worked on the book for a couple of years that I have more to say about it than, uh, than any other given fan. What's always fascinated me about casting is that you can take five guys who know the Spider-Man character inside and out, take the five biggest Spider-Man fans, you know, and then ask each of them in a separate room who should play Spider-Man and you will get five very <laughs> different answers. And that has always been fascinating to me, given that it's a visual medium, but there's still, Even a, if lot it's multiple there's choice, still a lot for the viewer to fill in. You know? Do you think that's still true if it's multiple choice? In other words, if we were to choose five different actors you know, with five different looks, do you think that still applies, that five yes. true Spider-Man fans yes. would pick? You yes. think so? When I, when I did my post, about because uh, there's an actor i mean he's he's kind of aged out of it now though he could be a hell of a peter parker for a spider girl series uh there's an actor named ethan Embry, who was in um a bunch of stuff uh, uh oh i can't think of the one the one team comedy he was in but there was a series called freaky links that was on for a while on fox he was the star of that and he checks a whole bunch of my boxes for peter parker but when I made that post, some people agreed, some people didn't, but everybody made their own suggestions. <laughs> and it was every, everything from uh, a young Robert Wagner to, to John Cusack, you know, that kind of thing. And oh, just, some, some of them looked really, really nerdy. Some of them were like movie star handsome and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> all of it from people who have read the comics the same way I did, you know, that kind of thing. So... Yeah, I, I, that's one of the things that I love about comics is that even though it's a visual medium, your imagination still plays a huge part of it. You know, um, we have that unlimited budget that, that, you know, people think they're asking this incredible question when they go, superhero movies, their popularity, why now, Ron? <laughs> and I just go, um, CGI, <laughs> because they invented computer graphics and now they can Absolutely. do it, you know, I mean... Absolutely. Back in the 70s, they couldn't do the Human Torch, you know? And by the way, and by the way, even with that limited, um, you know, special effects capability, let's not forget that, you know, Batman and Robin, the TV show was a huge success. Sure. You know, even, you know, the, the cheesy Captain Americas, they were successful to some extent, given sure. what they had. So, yeah. so, the, the, so the genre I'll was always a power. Back. Yeah, I mean, beyond Batman, I'll take you back to the George Reeves Superman show. That exactly. Thing was huge. You know, exactly. and, uh, they, they, you don't need an unlimited budget. I mean, I always said, all you need for a cool Spider-Man series is you need to do a couple of traveling shots. You need to find a, a way to do some, some web swinging, either blue Absolutely. Or, or, or whatever. But you get a breakdancing stuntman. Yes. In a suit. A gymnast, and, a gymnast. And gymnast, and you get them moving amongst a group of guys in shark skin suits and you got a Spider-Man show, <laughs> you know? If I may, and I know you haven't seen it because you, you said you haven't had a chance to do Netflix. I think um, a Netflix Daredevil series achieved that. It really, really did. I've seen a lot of clips from it on, uh, on YouTube and everything, so yeah. It is, it is good. It is really, really, really good. And they I mean, maximize- It's a little violent for my taste, to tell you the truth, but- uh, Oh, really? Oh, really I'm interesting. Old, I'm an old man. Yeah, I mean- the, <laughs> I didn't even see the scene, but the scene Brett Breeding told me about where the kingpin kills the guy with the car door. Um, that's, oh, that's, yeah, slams his head on the car door. And I, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I even saw the sequence where he's fighting in the hallway and the stairwell. And yes. He wasn't, but he wasn't using any gymnastics. It was just, it was just a guy. Oh, you didn't like that? Come he on, man. get the crap kicked out of him. I mean, it Come on. Yeah. That was a great <laughs> scene. Are you kidding me? Ben Affleck did Daredevil more more acrobatic than that. 
Oh my goodness! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Listen, like I said, just my opinion. But it's very easy. It's very. Easy <laughs> Let's move on to Salva Sema. That's interview something. I'm just kidding. <laughs> to, to piggyback on what you've been saying, how would you fix the Fantastic Four, uh, Mr. Prince? I, I don't think the Fantastic Four needs needs fixed. I think they're going to keep moving further and further away from what what they did get right in the Tim Story ones. The, the director that did the first Fantastic Four and Rise okay. of the Silver Surfer got a lot of things right. And what scares me is when they get something right in one version of a movie and then they reboot, they go yeah. around the block to not do it the same way again. Okay. And what, you know, so that's why like the Uncle Ben stuff got so murky in the, uh, in the second, spider-man films because they already did it okay they already did it right in the raimi films so they had to do something different You're and right. it just got very convoluted and you started wondering wait a minute why is he feeling guilty again <laughs> you know that kind of thing You're does right. he know that this is the same guy that he saw at the at the bodega you know that i it was very confusing to me so anytime they get something right you kind of worry when they're going to reboot it because look how far from, look how far from center the second the the, uh, the third Fantastic Four movie was. Yes, you know, I mean, they went. I guess they were trying to go with Ultimate Fantastic Four to some degree, but you know that director had a completely different vision of you know it being some kind of body horror thing like the Human Fly or something like that. Have you ever seen the Roger Corman <laughs> unreleased version yes. by any chance? Yes, I did. I have it on bootleg from a convention and I think it has, it got a lot of things right. It had no budget. So doing the human torch was, you know, okay guys. Impossible. But uh, you know, I mean, but even that they, they made changes that were, you know, the, the kind of changes that you see Hollywood make that they, that they somehow think make it more linear that I don't necessarily understand, you know, I mean, overall it was, and I do believe this, I think you can be too, too faithful to the comic. Okay. Um, because like, you know, Stan Lee's dialogue is not really meant to be said. Comic book no. dialogue is not really meant to be read out loud. Okay. For sure. Um, it is something that exists in this wonderful realm of your brain and your imagination. And, and it combined with the pictures, you know, the, the very idea that these guys talk as much as they do during a fight is something unique to the comic book form. Right. Know, because it's, you're telling the story on two different levels and, uh, and there's all kinds of technical aspects to it, but the bottom line is nobody's gonna have a conversation while they're beating the crap out of each other. So. <laughs> You know, I, you know, that I just really do feel there was a lot that was done right. I loved Michael Chiklis as Ben. I loved the relationship between all the characters. I thought Chris Evans was a terrific Johnny. Um, I liked uh, the young lady that played Susie with the, I can't think of her name right Jessica now. Jessica Alba. I thought Jessica Alba did fine. I got one friend of mine that's going, you just like her because she was hot because she wasn't right for the role at all. I said, I have a sister. I don't have a big sister, but I have a sister. I thought she played Johnny's sister incredibly well. I thought the scenes between her and Johnny were terrific, you know, and I, I thought, uh, you know, Reed was played differently than we've seen him in the books, but he got there, you know, so, cause that scene in Rise of the Silver Surfer where he stands up to the, uh, to the general, I thought was hilarious. I thought it was wonderful you know and uh and i thought all the characters you know interacted well together and, and i thought the silver surfer was well done it didn't bother me at all that you only saw galactus's shadow because oh you're killing really? me Rob. you're killing me I'm sorry. On, it, that didn't come bother on, me you at can't all. do this to me you no, can't come do come it on. come on if they would have shown a big guy in oh a my dress God. Don't, no, no, looming no, over new it. york city let me interrupt you, my friend. Let me because that's the that's what that's what everyone said, right? Oh, you can't have a big guy over New York City, except that you could. Except Transformers came out shortly thereafter, and there was no problem seeing a big guy. 
trust me. Oh my God, you're killing me. I think it can be done. I'm not not saying I I'm not saying I don't think it can be done. I've seen computer game simulations with Galactus that are absolutely great, you know. But I you know, it it didn't it didn't bother me. I I enjoyed it. I it was still Galactus to me. It's a mystery. They treated it like Galactus. When people say Galactus was just a cloud, no, he wasn't. You saw the lightning flash and you saw his silhouette. <laughs> it was Galactus. You are killing it. We were just talking about this. <laughs> we were just talking about this in a previous I mean, show. I, one of the people I'm, I talked to about Rise of the Silver Surfer, DeFalco and I were, were just sitting there with our jaws hanging because one of the pushbacks we heard about Rise of the Silver Surfer was that it starts out so boring. <clears throat> that they completely lost uh, lost interest in it. The first three minutes of the movie are a planet being destroyed. <laughs> you, know, you, see the, you see the thing come in and you see the planet. Yeah, but, but, but there's, the, and then there's, you see the, white, the, the, the glowing thing shoot out. And, <laughs> yeah, and there are things. ways. It's like, how ways, is that boring? How, there are ways to deliver, <clears throat> there, there are ways to deliver the same, same scene. One could be boring and one could be exciting. And if I, as a director, had the opportunity to show the destruction of a planet, uh, an inhabited planet, I'm telling you, I would have done it in a much more exciting way, much more impactful way, much more, right, well, you know, well, when well, you come... Well, we don't I'm know if it, was, if it was inhabited, but I don't, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with any of your individual <laughs> points. I, but, 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 the, here's the la- but here's the last point, though. It's a missed opportunity. You know, Galactus is a character. He's a beloved character. He's a character that stood the test of time. I look at the comic books as a testing ground for what could be done in the movies, right? Um, uh, so, so Galactus is one of the characters that has worked. That storyline is one of the major storylines in the Marvel verse that has been repeated over and over and over again. And, I, and they've gone back to that well many, many times. It's a precious story. So to have done that and to have depicted it in that way and to have missed the opportunity to, to make the, fa- let me ask you this. Wouldn't you have been happy to see Galactus on, on, on Earth, wouldn't you have sure. done that? Sure. So I, why I mean, that? That's you know, if they could have pulled it off, but if they weren't, if if they weren't sold on it, if they weren't going to do it right, then maybe it's not a missed opportunity. Maybe it's an opportunity that's waiting for Kevin Feige and his guys to do it in the Fantastic Four when it finally comes back to the Marvel Universe. <laughs> I mean, you know, you may still get to see that, and you'll be that much more thrilled. That that Tim's story saved that opportunity for you to enjoy it now. No, it, he didn't. He ruined the opportunity. He ruined, ruin it. He ruined the franchise, my friend. Go, By the no, second no, one, it was, it was over. We could have had. Comics. We could have been on Fantastic Four eight right now. We could have had. Let me tell you something. We could have had Namor. We could have had the Inhumans. We could have had if Tim's story had handled it right, with the proper depiction of Doctor Doom and Galactus. We could have gone with the Inhumans. We could have gone with. Uh, with the negative zone, with the nihilist. There's so many Fantastic Four stories you that could have been told. You think that the difference between a Fantastic Four 3 and no Fantastic Four 3 was the way they depicted Galactus at the end of that movie? I do, yes, I do. I do. I think the movie was a failure. I, I think the movie, I think fans didn't respond to it. And I think, I think, yeah, if I every think. Every fan of the Fantastic Four comic went and saw a movie 10 times, it would be a flop. No, so, so here's, the, here's the thing, here's the thing. So here's the thing that I think a lot of people misunderstand. The fans are fans for a reason. Right. And when you have a, 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 a subject or a character or a book that has a group of fans, let's say a group of fans of 10,000 people, those fans are fanatics of that material for a reason, which when introduced to the general public will tend to also resonate with that general public. And so that's been proven in the comic book in in, in the translation of comic book to movies, the closer you stick to the source material, the more successful and more accepted those movies are. That's, that's been shown. And so it isn't that the fans would have made it successful. It is that the material would have been richer. It would have been better. It would have been more powerful and it would have been much more impactful. Quick example, The Crow had maybe 10 people, relatively speaking, 10 people as fans of The Crow. You translate that literally to the movies, guess what? It's one of the classic movies that, that 
achieve the same level of success within the cinematic verse as the book did within the comic book verse. Pro movie was as close to the books as really? Oh yeah. You don't think so? The Crow? No, I, I read the books and I loved the movie, but I didn't think it was a, a really faithful adaptation, no. Uh, huh. Really? You don't think you don't think the crow was a faithful adaptation to the book? I, I thought it had captured the spirit of it and everything, but no, I didn't think it was, you know. Secret. The look was the same. The, I mean, they're all, you know. It's, it's there, yeah. But I mean, the thing at the end with the, where he loses his power for a while with the crow gets oh, shot. Oh, true, true. Well, let, let's agree on one thing. It's, it's, the, it's the, go their own way with that kind of stuff. It's the Raimi dynamic, the Spider-Man dynamic, because I agree with you, ultimately changes have to be made. And I do agree with you that one of the first things that has to go is the dialogue from comic book to, to movies. That, that does have to go. And Raimi, for example, in the Spider-Man depiction, made a lot of compromises. You know, he basically melded Mary Jane and Gwen Stacy into one character. I mean, he made a lot of different changes that are, to me, within the realm of acceptability. I think that there are some changes that take away from the true experience of the character. And, and, um, and I think when you go too far, I think you, you hurt it, and I think you, you make a disconnection. And I, and I do believe that if, if the Fantastic Four had been handled well, the response would have been much greater, as has been proven with, for example, with the Avengers and so on and so forth. Well, I was surprised that the Fantastic Four wasn't a bigger hit. I was also surprised that not a single reviewer mentioned what was so different about the Fantastic Four, which was that they were celebrities. They were celebrities without secret identities. Not a single review that I read mentioned that that was different for superheroes. That that's that was, right. Because that's what made the Fantastic Four unique back in the day. And that's what made them unique in that movie. And yeah, especially in um, Rise of the Silver Surfer, because they did the wedding and all that kind of stuff, that I was shocked that nobody... That nobody caught that. Nobody saw that as being different from Spider-Man or Batman or Superman or any, or any of the other characters that had been on cinema. So, so there was just, I don't know what happened. I don't know if the marketing was bad. I don't know what the deal was. Because, yeah, you'd think the Fantastic Four would be as popular if done. But, but I mean, that's the thing. I, 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 don't, I, don't revol I don't revolve that choice around... Galactus as much as much as you have. I, I respect your opinion. I respect all the fans who were pissed off by it, but it, it just annoys me when they say, well, Galactus was just a cloud because he wasn't just a cloud. He's right up there, you know, come on, he was there. <laughs> wait a second, wait a he, second. Wait. never read I, a Kevin, Fantastic Four comic book. He hold on a second. never Kevin. read a Fantastic Four comic book. As the Silver Surfer goes up into that cloud and you see the lightning flash and you see the silhouette of something, it shows that there's something in there that's not that cloud. Kevin, I mean, sorry. Yes? <laughs> Kevin, I apologize. Listen, I'm dominating. It's, it's fine. I, I I'm, like I said, I'm learning, so this is good. I apologize, and you're going to forgive me later. And by the way, I, and I don't want to keep you forever either, Rob, uh, but, and I know that, Kevin, you want to talk about some of the Star Trek and Star Wars uh, work that, that Ron Friends has done. But getting back to you, Rob, Getting back to you. Wait a second, Robert. What are you doing? Galactus was just a cloud. You can't do that. You can't say to me. Yes, I that... can't because it's on film. It's it's right there on film. Uh, there's a silhouette of Galactus in the movie. But a, sil but a silhouette does not a, 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 a figure make. No, but what I'm saying is, even if you don't know what Galactus looks like. Yes. There is a scene in that movie where as the Silver Surfer goes up into the cloud and you see the lightning flash, you yes. see the silhouette of something. So but first of all, first of all, first of all, first of all, let, 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 let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Galactus is something in that cloud. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a direct question. Direct question. Assuming that you, as you said to me, assuming you don't know Galactus, like you don't know, the you haven't read the comic books. Right. And assuming you watch that movie, Okay, and assuming that you have the ability to rewind that scene five times, right? Can someone who's never seen Galactus at the end of the movie depict Galactus and draw like the outline of Galactus? Of course. Not. Without having been told that there's an image in the cloud, without having been told to look for something in the clouds. No, I'm not could... even saying that they're seeing it as an image. What they're seeing is that there's something in the cloud. 
that Galactus isn't the cloud, it's something in the cloud. Yeah, but I mean, come on. Yeah, but listen, I'm not, I, I hear, I, I'm, not I'm not even going to defend it as a choice. But the bottom line is, it didn't, it didn't bother me because I know what Galactus looks like, and I know that was the silhouette of Galactus in that cloud. <laughs> This looks like a job for Superman. Hey, look! It's Spider-Man! The dynamic, the dynamic duo, duo returns. Return. Next, Next week, don't, don't miss it! Miss it.